Hello, you there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> um, hold on. Hey, you go. Hey. There we are. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> I'm here. There are people outside. Okay, we're going to get started again if everyone wants to take a seat who's in the room. Um, so I oh, Will's disappeared. <laughs> no, I'm here. I'm closing my door. <laughs> Okay, so the children will, the children will be. Brilliant. I'm really delighted to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Will Bynum. Uh, will and I have been collaborating for a couple of years now, and it's really exciting for me to have him speak at this event. Um, so just to int briefly introduce Will to give you some idea of where he's coming from. Um, he's currently an Associate Professor of Family Medicine in uh, the Duke University School of Medicine. And prior to arriving at Duke, he served for seven years on active duty in the US Air Force. Um, Will currently serves as the Duke Family Medicine Residency Program Director and Faculty Advisor to the Duke School of Medicine Student Wellness Committee, and his academic interest centers on the role um, of shame in the medical learning experience. And he's also currently conducting a program of research through a PhD in health professions education at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. And Will is going to speak to us today about his research um, around learning medicine in the shadow of shame. So I'll hand it over to you, Will. Uh, thanks, Luna. I I'm, I'm first so sorry about the state of my voice. Um, I blame it on either my two or my three-year-old, but um, I'm gonna do my very best to project today. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. I'm, I'm extremely jealous of anyone in the room. This, this is a, an event that has been on my calendar for more than two years. Um, and, and one of the events out that I'm most excited about because I think it, it brings together a, a small but growing body of people that are addressing a topic that is, it's hard to conceptualize um, just how little attention this has gotten in some of our communities and some of our circles. And so it's very exciting to be here. Um, I can't thank Luna Alice um, enough for putting this together and, and to the University of Copenhagen for being gracious hosts um, and then to all of you that are joining. So thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm really um, excited to have a chance to tell you about some of the work we're doing um, around shame and medical education and, um, and you know, to speak to a group that really is as passionate as I am about this topic. So I don't have any disclosures to report. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to um, take you through a kind of an, a high level overview of our program of research. Uh, and I'm gonna take you through some of the methods we're using, uh, a lot of the findings and some of the implications. And to frame it, um, I want to um, use the metaphor of fire as, as a way to, to think about shame in medical education. And this is coming from my research <clears throat> as well as um, you know, the body of psychology that, that has told us a lot about how this emotion can occur. We've come to conceptualize or, or view metaphorically shame through the lens of fire. Um, and it's, it's a, a significant reaction within an individual that is in many ways uniquely individual um, in, in terms of the ways in which it develops through appraisals and attributions. But critically, it, it occurs as, as all of you know, through um, interactions with the environment around the individual. So there's a very strong sociocultural context and influence in which shame occurs. Uh, and we're finding this to be the case in, in medical education. So I'm gonna um, just comment briefly on the medical training pipeline. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how many, I, I can't really see you all well enough to know if you would raise your hand, but how, if, if any of you are in um, medicine, I'm sure a number of you are, um, and wherever you're coming from, I imagine your medical training pipelines are similar. But if we consider um, shame to be uh, like a fire, then, then the medical training pipeline is like a, is like a box of matches. Um, or it's in many ways, like a, it's like filling up your, your car at a gas station where there's, where there's a gas leak. It's just primed for the development of shame. And one of the big reasons, or the, among the many reasons for this are the rigor of the training the high stakes nature of medicine um, and learning medicine, you're not just learning a, a trade or a vocation, you're, you're learning a profession 
and you're doing it while you're practicing on real people who's um, who are affected by the outcomes in, in your of your learning. Um, we also have uh, cultures in medical education that are not so conducive to learning, whether it's high rates of mistreatment, toxic learning environments, et cetera. So we've come to conceptualize um, shame as being embedded in the, in the medical training pipeline, albeit quite hidden. Um, when I um, when I was a trainee, uh, I, I experienced this combustibility, if you will, um, and I experienced an explosion. Um, and it, it occurred when I was a, a, on labor and delivery as a second year resident early in my year. It was the first time I'd been a senior resident on, on labor and delivery. And um, the, a long story short is that I, I was involved in a, 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 an emergency situation where I had to deliver the baby using a certain assistive device, a vacuum assisted device. Um, and, and in the process of, of doing, of delivering the baby, I caused a really significant maternal injury. It was a significant vaginal laceration that was so significant that um, it was one of those in instances where everybody immediately in the room knew that something had gone wrong. And, um, you know, anyone who knows shame personally or studied it knows what comes next. Um, I had just an immediate fight or flight response, incredible fear and anxiety, overwhelming dread. Um, as one of our participants said, it was like my, my bowels fell out on the floor as I'm standing there having made this error in the moment, perceiving all sorts of judgment around me um, and just feeling like I needed to escape. And so I did, I escaped and I, I, I went down, I left the room quietly and I went to um, a meditation room on the other side of the hospital where, where I sat um, alone and had a major significant emotional reaction that later turned out to be shame. That I later learned was shame. And, and, if, and if shame is a fire, this was a, this was a forest fire for me. I mean, this was, this was something that really overtook me um, in, in a profound way. And uh, not only in the moment, but in the aftermath of it for, for days and weeks, I really struggled um, with feelings of inadequacy, um, being a fraud, not being good enough, um, being um, incompetent, not being worthy of trust from supervisors and colleagues. And all this was despite the fact that I had been a pretty solid resident, a good resident up to that point. And I had earned those things, but I felt like this, this one instance, it, it gave it all away. And, and what I was experiencing at the time, um, we have labeled it in our, in our, in our work, um, a sentinel emotional event. So there's a term in healthcare called sentinel events, which are errors or outcomes that lead to significant morbidity and mortality for patients. Uh, and, and we engage with them in a way that really tries to prevent them from happening again and to understand their origins. And, and this was like a sentinel emotional event in the course of my learning. Um, it was a lot of emotional morbidity. I mean, I, it was a lot of suffering, um, but unlike a fire, it, it was really silent and, and it was smokeless and people didn't know around me that this was going on. When I later discovered that this was shame, um, I did so you know, with the help of sociologist Br Brene Brown, who I'm sure you're familiar with, um, whose work is just so kind of transcendental in terms of making this emotion acceptable, making it um, uh, ac accessible and available to us and making it real. And, and once I figured out it was shame, it was a huge relief. Um, and in and, and the aftermath and the recovery of, of this event, um, you know, I, I thought a lot about how this emotion was showing up around me. Uh, you know, it, certainly if I had experienced this so easily and certainly it was going on around me. And, and so we um, went into the medical education literature and the psychology literature. And what we found was a huge gap around how medical trainees um, and learners experience shame across the continuum of medicine. There was signal that this was occurring, but, but very little um, explicit attention paid to the role of shame. So the, the, the fundamental research question that we've asked is, is this one. Um, and it's, it's a qualitative, um, qualitatively oriented question. It's a constructivist 
um, underpinned question where we, aside from our own experiences of shame with which we can't depart, we, we ask, ask this question in a foundational way, not presupposing that we know anything about how, how shame occurs in um, medical learning environments. And that, um, and, and wanting to build an understanding of that um, constructively from the ground up rather than deductively. Um, so inductively uh, and from a constructivist lens rather than deductively. And to underpin our work, um, we've really relied on Tracy and Robin's theory of self-conscious emotion. Um, this is one of a number of theories or approaches that draws upon the large body of empiric work that has, has um, differentiated the self-conscious emotions based on the, the behavior self distinction. So I'm, I'm not gonna lecture to a, a group of experts on um, what shame is in psychology, but just to be clear about where we're coming from with this, shame being an emotion, uh, an emotional state that occurs in response to typically a triggering event, not always, in which a person is negatively globally assessing themselves um, and viewing themselves as deficient, flawed, unworthy, whereas guilt is, is really um, occurs more from attributions to specific behaviors, um, circumstances, things that are, that are you know, uh, less stable, more modifiable about the person or the environment in which they work. Both emotions come from um, a recognition that, that, that because of what I've done or what's happened, I am, I am understanding or knowing myself as further from who I'm trying to be. And that that, that um, incongruence between current and future self or ideal self uh, is one of the antecedents to these emotions. And that has real meaning in, in medical education where, where our expectations and, and um, standards and the things that, that uh, we're held to are, are lofty. My dog is scratching the door and I'm gonna let him in because he's driving crazy. All right, the joys of presenting from home. Um, so in this pro uh, program of research, um, we started the study in, um, in medical residents. Uh, it continued on to medical students. And then re having recognized upstream influences that seemed to really matter in terms of medical learners, we um, turned our attention to pre-medical students. And, and that's a study we're completing right now. In each of the studies, we used a, a similar basic approach to data collection. Um, we, we, well, we enrolled 12 students in study one, 16 students in studies two and three, and, and 12 students in study four, all from um, United States medical schools. Um, it was internal medicine residents, and then preclinical and clinical year medical students, and then pre-medical students who are in a master's of um, biomedical sciences program that are, that are planning to go into medicine. Um, in each of the, the data collection sessions, we, we started with an elicitation technique. So either a, a written um, reflection on um, a specific experience or set of experiences during their training that, that caused them to feel shame. Um, we then engaged in a one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interview where we went very deeply into those experiences. I'm sure many of you have done this type of work. It's amazing and profound how much people are willing to share about their shame when you provide a forum that's safe for them to do so. so these interviews were really, really um, deep and, and meaningful. And then we engaged in a debriefing session where um, we assessed for any distress that may have developed during the interview, um, situated their findings um, amid other findings, and then um, provided support resources should they, they be needed. The, the method that we use to analyze our data is hermeneutic phenomenology. And, and this has been a, a just tremendously helpful methodology, challenging methodology um, for the study of shame. So hermeneutics seeks to um, describe and convey both the nature and the meaning of a phenomenon. So it, it goes beyond being purely descriptive um, to trying to understand, conceptualize, and then communicate the deeper meaning of the structures that govern those experiences. Um, and, and in particular, it takes um, it takes context and environment in specifically into account. And, and that's very important given that the environment in which shame in healthcare and in medical education is occurring. Um, we, so we, I'm just gonna kind of brief, very briefly mention 
a couple of highlights of the methods. I could talk about this in much more length. I would bore all of you to tears, so I'm not going to do that. But um, we followed a Jolly and Higgs uh, six steps of hermeneutic analysis. So if you've done any phenomenological work, especially hermeneutics, um, I really recommend this, this um, paper and the approach that they have taken in terms of um, the stages of hermeneutic analysis. They, it, it follows other um, constructivist oriented qualitative methods in that it's about elaboration of the first order codes, second order codes, themes, um, and then really trying to, to synthesize and, and integrate all those themes into a cohesive whole. But what hermeneutics I think does a little differently is one, it, it, it requires that we bring our own experiences with the phenomenon into the data analysis and the data collection. And that's different than descriptive phenomenology um, in which we bracket that off or we attempt to. Now, I mean, as a logical, rational human, I, I, there's no way to bracket off experiences that have happened to us, especially those experiences like shame that are so deeply impactful. Um, and so this method, rather than trying to do that in a futile manner, it, it says that those experiences are critical. They bring us to the research. And, and they're, so, they're very important for developing a deeper understanding of this phenomenon through shared meaning making um, with participants. Um, we, all, we engaged in uh, what um, Van Manning calls cycles of writing and rewriting. So it's part of the methodology. I get it now, I didn't understand it at first. It's just that write and write and write and rewrite and rewrite. It's so much writing. And, and I use a lot of PowerPoint, um, a lot of visual, um, Kind of writing and, uh, and it really over time what, what emerges is, is a is a, a succinct set a succinct description that really emphasizes the essences of a lived phenomenon um, and, and importantly that it tends to both the parts of the lived experience and the whole of that experience so not only what are the elements of of shame and i'm going to tell you some of those elements but how do those elements interact with one another within an individual in their environment to give rise to the meaning of, of, this, um, of this phenomenon of shame as experienced within, within an environment. And so um, I'm gonna take you through <clears throat> some of the findings. Um, again, this is fairly high level and it's, it's, it's with a topic as sort of rich as this, it's very hard to figure out what to, what to present and what to leave out. Um, but I'm gonna, I think, take you through what are the, the key findings um, and I'm going to structure it in a way that takes you through some of the elements, so some of the parts of this experience, and then and then talk about a few of the key essences or, or sort of those deeper meanings um, about shame in this population, and then what, what we need to do about it. Um, so the first thing I'm going to tell you about are the triggers. So in our study of residents, um, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just the, the primary ones. We found triggers, not surprisingly, related to patient care. Um, and... Um, the two most profound shame stories among residents were those that in which they, the resident perceived they made an error that led to the death of a patient or that killed a patient. And the shame was truly profound that, that could result from this. Um, we found um, it wasn't just you know, patient care related to major errors. Um, it could be more minor um, infractions with patients, showing emotion, having impaired empathy. Um, and then we found a lot of um, a lot of shame related to learning. Um, and, and this was a problem um, in a couple of ways. We identified that there were two kind of sets of shame triggers related to learning. There was one that in which um, the triggers we would consider to be normal or um, inevitable. You know, you can't, you cannot, um, can't get around them in a learning process. Things like being wrong in public, struggling with a presentation, um, having, you know, being corrected, getting below average on a test, things that are just normal in a learning process, yet they cause significant shame. Uh, and so that, that was notable. We also found another set that were related to events that would not be considered normal um, in, in training or in any learning process, such as being yelled at, being humiliated, um, being harshly interrogated with the intent to humiliate, being marginalized on the team, um, you know, various forms of mistreatment that, that occur within learning processes 
and frankly, surprise, un, not surprisingly led to a lot of shame, but were considered a, a part of that learning process. In the resident study, we did find some shame related to assessment, um, board scores, uh, things in medical school that had taken root, but not nearly as much as we found in medical students. In medical students, we found this was really the predominant shame trigger, um, shame related to MCAT scores, which are the tests you take to come into medical school, board exams in uh, medical school, grades, uh, in, end of rotation uh, exams, et cetera. And um, to the extent that, that grades and objective measures of performance became one of the most potent shame triggers for medical students who were seeking to be competitive for admission into residency. Um, we, when we looked at the things that inflame shame, so either prime the environment for it or make, make uh, the environment worse, um, we found um, perfectionism was rampant in our data set. Uh, we found um, a lot of comparisons to others. This was almost ubiquitous um, in our medical student data that in unpacking why uh, and how shame occurred, there was some role of comparing myself to someone else. Uh, in many ways, it set the standards uh, on which my self-evaluation relied, um, and it often done un, um, inaccurately. Underrepresentation was a significant um, shame contributor, and, and it could even be a shame trigger um, in that people who, and this was more common among medical students and pre-medical students, people who um, perceive themselves to be or were outside of dominant cultural norms, um, either by virtue of their race, their ethnicity, their um, gender identity or sexual orientation, where they're from in the country, what their um, you know, educational background was, that, that experience of being outside of, of the dominant norm or the, the dominant group could fuel significant shame, particularly in the presence of triggers that suggested that, that that um, they didn't belong or that they're, they should not have been admitted to medical school. Any struggle on a test, um, making a, a stupid comment in a group setting, um, being mistreated, those would interact with the experience of being minoritized in the environment um, that could really amplify a shame reaction and in many ways prove to someone that they did not belong, that they were not worthy. Um, and those were feelings that they had really walking into school on day one. So it, it, it um, it really opens up sort of a gauntlet around what it means to be underrepresented in a, in a healthcare professions training environment and, and whether or not our environments are prepared. As we diversify rightly, are we prepared to, to really create the inclusive, psychologically safe, shame sensitive environments that people from all walks of life require? And I would, I would argue that we, we are not prepared to do that right now. And then we found um, quite a bit of. Um, what we call performance-based self-esteem. I'm gonna unpack this further in a few minutes. Uh, I'll just say for now that we identified a, a, a pervasive pattern across all three studies by which um, a relationship between performance and self-worth seems to have developed. High levels of performance um, led to feelings of self-worth. And so if I am at the top of my class, if I do well on the board exam, um, et cetera, then I feel good about myself. Um, the, the, the reality of this relationship is that in order to then sustain high levels of self-worth, I have to ha sustain continued high levels of performance. And as, as I'm going to tell you in a minute, that becomes very difficult. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. Um, when we look oh, actually, um, when we look at um, some of the outcomes of shame, so I've taken you through some of the triggers uh, or factors. Um, th this is why this matters, uh, and, and there's a lot of parallel here overlap with the um, with the psychology literature. We found really significant outcomes of, of this emotion in health professions trainees. A lot of social isolation and impaired belonging, um, and the impaired belonging and isolation could fuel further shame through the disengagement it caused. Um, disengagement with learning. So as one person said, I lost all motivation to learn. Um, I, I stopped caring. I stopped trying to teach my colleagues. I stopped trying to be a good resident. Um, and this was really alarming and, and problematic, not only in a moment in a patient care environment where patients could be at risk, but for future learning um, and future um, engagement 
and, and the downstream effects on patients. Uh, the, the two of these combined were very concerning. A lot of diminished psychological and physical wellness. So um, feelings of burnout and depression, as one person said, um, feeling like a sedentary bum. I just, I stopped exercising, I stopped eating right, I stopped sleeping well, or I slept too much. Um, a, a significant amount of impaired um, physical and psychological wellness, and then impaired empathy. Um, th this one was um, the fairly shocking, actually, at times, the degree to which shame and, and associated experiences like burnout could impair empathy. Uh, we had one, one second year resident who reflected on a time during his, in, his first year of residency where he had cumulative prolonged shame around perceived underperformance, not belonging, and then, and then significant burnout. <clears throat> and he was reflecting on a particularly hard day on inpatient medicine in which he had a patient that was very complex and sick and taking up a lot of his time and really driving some of these feelings. And he, and he, re he recalled wishing that patient would die so that he would have less work to do and, and so that he could recover. And, and then even in the interview, the act of recalling that state was distressing for him. Um, and, it, and it really, he reflected, fueled additional shame. So shame just based on the effects of shame, which we call, we call um, secondary shame. And, and, and the, to the depths of which this emotion can impair our ability to interact with those around us, to empathize with those around us, and really to understand ourselves as the empathic people we're trying to become. We also found, um, and this is really important, um, this finding that, that in a shame state, some people could respond with reduced self-regulation, especially emotionally and unprofessional behavior. So we had this one participant who was having a significant shame reaction, um, really significant, related to not becoming not being selected as the chief resident, who's like the leader of the residence by his peers. And this was a this was a particularly problematic for him and his um, identity because he had viewed himself as a chief re future chief resident for years, years, well back in the medical school, um, because there were things about him that he struggled with socially, with sports, et cetera. His academic prowess and his need to be the best really took center stage in his identity. So when he was not selected to be the chief resident, which is something he fully expected to happen, he had a huge shame reaction. And in the midst of the shame reaction, he was working in the emergency department and his attending gave him feedback he didn't want to hear. And he, he said, in that moment, I lost it. I had no fortitude. I could not self-regulate. And I just unleashed my true feelings, which came in the form of cussing her out, um, yelling at the attending with, you know, all sorts of expletives in the middle of a, of a busy emergency apartment, which is completely unacceptable and unprofessional and led to a really severe remediation process. He, he said, and I, as a program director, I understand what this quote means. He said that my program descended upon me rapidly by the end of that day. And, and so that he was really within 12 hours, um, as he viewed it, a major pariah within his program. Something really interesting happened with this interview. So the, the first half of the interview was really all about his outward defensiveness and his anger um, about this situation. He's still really angry about it. And as our researchers, the, my colleagues were, were, and I had done the interview, so I knew the whole story, as they went through the early parts of the transcript, these were some of their margin notes. And, and something was happening in, this, in, the, in their analysis that was probably happening to him in real life. Um, the, one of our researchers said, I, I don't see sh shame in this story so far. I see anger. In fact, this person doesn't feel inclined to shame. Um, another reflected, this is, this is like a, a victim martyr complex um it's all all these people are attacking amazing me uh and i can't believe i wasn't selected in this position who wouldn't have re reacted this way and this is my favorite one um this guy is unlikable I, i'd love to meet his wife which is you know this is just kind of real talk in the in the margins of our research but what what this reflects is something that was happening to this individual um during the course of this experience is that because his outward displays, the outward manifestations of his shame 
looked like this. So they were, you know, he was defensive, projecting blame, showing apathy, a lot of anger. Um, in many ways, this was a narcissistic response. We were picking up on that in the interview and we were reacting to it. And, and in an irritated, frustrated kind of way, imagine how the people around him were reacting when really behind the wall was an extremely vulnerable, damaged, acutely, um, and fragile person. And the, the reaction that followed, which was a harsh remediation, really made that shame worse. And so the, um, I drew this picture during the process of analysis. I think I redrew it like three times. This is the best I could get it. And we submitted it to the journal of academic medicine and we published this. And they said, oh, this is great. This is really important. Can you please pay a professional to, to draw this? Um, and so this is what we came up with. Um, and I think this is an incredibly important um, slide for, for anyone working with anybody who's uh, prone to shame, particularly in a professional environment. Before we react harshly to what are often labeled, rightly, unprofessional behaviors, we really have got to consider the possible presence of shame um, and other emotional drivers of that behavior uh, so that we can provide the right level of support. Um, the most recent study we published um, was, was really a kind of a hardcore phenomenology study that really meant to characterize how shame feels, what it makes us want to do, what effects it causes. And this is this is from a study in medical students. Um, I show this table. This is will look familiar to many of you. It looks like you, you know, comes out of my psychology journal. Um, these are the elements of, of a shame reaction, kind of at the most fundamental level. Um, I, I just put it up, um, you know, as a, as a uh, example to all of you, and then it's really helpful to show this to people that don't really know what shame is. Just to, just to um, illustrate how complex this emotional state is, in any given person, not all of these are going to be present, but, but many of them often are. And what's really um, notable about this in medical trainees, especially, and probably in most people, is that this, these processes are very often going on behind a silent, stoic exterior. The, the, the world around the person does not understand. They don't understand the, the depth of this complexity and some of what could be going on. Um, and yet it's happening under the hood and in the midst of learning and patient care and, and trying to just navigate the environment around you. Um, so what we found is that kind of the overall essence of this study. So looking at the relationships and why all this matters among the, the elements, we found um, shame to be a destabilizing emotional state. In medical trainees. Um, and, I, and I think there's some, there's some empiric support for this in psychology, but it really is an emotional state that throws people off their axis. I really love this quote. It was from a, a student in his clinical year reflecting on the transition out of the classroom environment where he really struggled clinically. And he said, it was like I was being held up by the drafts of my success from first year. I wasn't plummeting, but I wasn't safe anymore. And that, that being sort of the destabilization that can happen with chronic shame. Um, we also found a lot acutely that could occur, like depersonalization, disorientation, what one person labeled, you know, emotional vertigo, um, or feeling like I'm just sort of out to sea and unmoored. So uh, this is one of the projects Luna and I have worked on together uh, with Charlotte Wu, um, who's, who's with um, Harness Health Global in London. Um, it's a really fun project. Um, and it's supported by a grant from Duke and Exeter, um, as well as some of the, the Welcome Trust funding. Um, we, we solicited uh, graphic medicine submissions from illustrators across the world. And we ended up with two brilliant, incredibly talented women um, that each created a different graphic medicine piece. And Luna, maybe you could share our most recent publication um, on a break. But the one I'm going to show you is, is illustrated by Hannah Mumby, um, who is actually uh, based out of Exeter. Um, and, and we asked her to take the phenomenology of this research study um, and to try and put it into a visual form. And, and um, her, as you're going to see, her, her artistic style is just so well suited for this. And so I'm going to take you through that um, to kind of visually show how this might feel in another way. Um, so <coughs> in this panel, um, it's, it's a little bit meant to be open-ended what really could be happening here. It's some sort of a, a public learning exchange in, in a healthcare environment. And this person is 
um, experiencing an emotional reaction, um, really the start of a shame reaction in response to whatever's going on, whatever the trigger is um, in this panel. Uh, and you can fill in the blanks about what this could be and we could certainly discuss it. As a part of that, the person really begins to develop a kind of an affective upswell of emotion um, that, that really that often was uh, in our research visible and in acute distress. And, and I experienced this myself in, when I made the error in obstetrics. Um, this came from our work as well as some of my own experiences, the eyes. So the judgmental eyes, and this is the perceived eyes of the people around me as I'm entering into the shame state. Um, and, then, and then feeling like a real urge to need to hide this emotional reaction uh, and, to, and to sort of disappear and, and unravel really um, in, a, in a private place, such as a bathroom stall, a stairwell, et cetera. We had numerous stories of people from this one study that um, followed this trajectory. Importantly, we found that um, not for all shame reactions, but for many, especially the ones that were more profound, the deeper intrusive negative self-evaluation often came after the, the real affective upswell died down. And we think that may be because it then um, created cognitive capacity and resources for engaging in that self-evaluation. I mean, if you've been in a fight or flight response, it's not, you're not, you're, you're not in your, you know, think, you're not thinking your clearest at that moment. Once a little bit of that clarity returned, the more intrusive self-evaluation could occur. And, and, and we asked Hannah, and she did such a great job to, to try and capture the energy that is happening internally as a shame reaction builds and develops. Um, and, and it can be, it's like swirling energy. And this is where some of the disorientation comes in. And it's very often done in sort of a, a private place. The environment was notable here for being kind of cool and, and a little bit um, isolated and distant. If this thought process and the runaway thinking that can lead to shame goes unabated, the energy can really grow and intensify. The questions about whether I'm good enough become statements being yelled at me by the voice in my head. Um, it, we found that like kind of pro progressive series of dominoes, other areas of my life that can become implicated sort of in the shame wildfire that's taking over. Um, all the while in, in, a, in the midst of deepening shame, we, you, we can then experience distortion in terms of the way that we view ourselves relative to how objective reality would view us. And, and this is really depicted here by the distorting of the room. We call this the skewed frame of reference, having, having real difficulty accurately self-evaluating in the midst of a, of a deep and profound shame reaction. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, resolve this the series of, uh, of panels in a minute um, and at the end, but what I wanna do first is take you through a couple more of the key essences here. Um, the first being what is destabilizing um, and this isn't a question we asked, it's a question that was answered though, um, through our most recent study in pre-medical students. And it appears that it's not just an emotional destabilization, but there is something much deeper that's being destabilized here, which we've identified as self-concept. And self-concept, there's a huge bodies of work in psychology around it. I actually like one of the earliest definitions, the best of this is simple. It's what we think about when we think about ourselves. So it's, it's the ways the semantics or the words that we use to describe ourselves, the visual representations, how we view ourselves and how we feel about ourselves effectively that govern who we are, who we were and who we can become. So self-concept really tra travels along a trajectory and it encompasses our identity and it encompasses the contingencies of self-esteem or self-worth that really hate, help us shape that identity. What we're finding is that shame involves a challenge or in significant cases, a, a change to self-concept. It skews our evaluation of who we are in the moment. Um, it implicates who we were. And this is um, the, the paper we're finishing now, which really um, what we found is a lot of past experience that is salient in a present shame reaction, uh, particularly things like trauma, um, performance-based self-esteem, how I was raised by my family, et cetera. And none of that is new knowledge from psychology. But when you think about the experience of a medical trainee, we so often fail to consider their past, where they're coming from, um, what they may have experienced. And, and that's problematic because it is incredibly salient in, in a present shame reaction. 
and it impacts our perception uh, and sometimes our reality of who we can become, really changing and shaping that ideal self, um, opening doors or closing them, depending on how the shame is sort of engaged with. Another way of thinking about this, you know, when this is a slide I made years back, I think, related to some of my own experiences that have really, it's been reinforced a lot of our data that, that as we race towards what the profession demands of us or who we need to be or want to be within that profession, particularly around needing to be the best, needing to maintain performance, find belonging, prove ourselves. In order to do that and, and make the space for that, we have to shed other things about us, other contingencies of our self-esteem, elements of our self-concepts that not only have made us who we are as people, but that have buffered against shame that may occur from something like academic performance. Uh, and so this, there's a, there's a pressure here to let some of these things go in order to make room for what's required to become a physician. And now this, this was my telling as a white man in medicine, um, you know, what I have never experienced because I'm in the dominant norm everywhere I go is what I would conceptualize as a fan. I think about a big fan in front of this individual that they're running towards, blowing backwards at them, blowing these things off even faster. And that fan, you know, representing the experience of being minoritized or underrepresented in an environment, an environment that has incredible assimilation pressure to adhere to a set of norms and standards that may not represent you and certainly weren't built for you. Um, and, and that being really an, an amplifier of this overall sort of um, identity narrowing, if you will. Um, the, the last essence I'm going to tell you about, just a, a couple of, uh, minutes about um, performance. And so again, returning to this idea that high levels of performance drive self-worth and sustaining self-worth then becomes dependent on high levels of performance. Um, just a couple of quotes here about you know, really, this is right. The bottom one is essentially shame, right? So if my performance is subpar, then I as a person am subpar. Um, and so what uh, I just want to um, bring in this term performance-based self-esteem briefly. This is from psychology. We, did, we discovered it after we sort of identified this relationship. It was very exciting discovering it. Um, and if you, could, if you consider performance-based self-esteem, you know, which is self-worth that's contingent upon my perceived level of performance and accomplishment. Uh, if you conceptualize it as, as, as a tree, if this is sort of the product of, of reactions and interactions over time, this tree has roots that feed it, that have led to its growth. And those roots we're finding go well back in early education, um, grade school, I mean, way back, elementary school, even where scores were used as currency for things like reward, for love, um, for acceptance, um, and not surprisingly for self-worth, it, it is amplified and deepened during pre-medical studies, particularly the through the, the extreme reliance we have on, on scores for making admissions decision into the profession. And then it gets deepened further in medical school where, where this relationship with scores um, really grows and, and the need to perform objectively at a high level is, is fever pitch especially when you think about needing to be comp competitive for entering um, residency. Um, but these roots don't just grow on their own. We water them. <clears throat> we, we have tended them. <clears throat> and we've tended them, <clears throat> sorry, through our high stakes admissions processes, which rely heavily on scores, intense competition and, and this reliance. I and mean, we, we have an, an obsession with scores in our educational systems. Um, and as I've become more aware of this, I've just noticed in so many ways how we rely on scores to make assessments or de determinations about the value of a person, of a school, of an educational system, et cetera. What this research and others might suggest is that there's a real emotional toll or impact of the way we use those scores. Um, okay. Uh, this last point about um, performance-based self-esteem is, and this becomes a real challenge when students move out of the objective environment of grades and into the subjective environment of clinical medicine and clinical training. Like one person said from our study, it was like I was being measured more and more as a resident 
with less and less of a measuring stick. They, you then rely on other sources to determine how good you are at your self-worth and whether you belong. And those sources are often very inaccurate. They're subjective. Um, they're imperfect. And at the heart of that is, is shame. I'm going to just um, finish with uh, just a few key takeaways. Um, any one of these things we could talk about at length. Um, but I'm just, these are some highlights from really what I've told you about today um, and things for us to think about as, as we um, really commit ourselves to educating better and creating better learning environments for, for our students. Um, the first is that and this has been hopefully kind of apparent throughout that medical learning environments appear to be, have, have inherent risk of shame. Uh, embedded within them. I, I'm not necessarily going to say they're in, shame is inevitable. Um, I do think things like burnout are inevitable. Um, and, you know, in many ways, you could potentially even argue that shame is, but it's certainly inherent that by virtue of the nature of those environments and the individuals that enter them and the nature of the work, shame is likely to occur. And I don't think we have grasped that concept yet. I think we really grasp the risk of burnout and depression and other things that we can measure easily, but we are not attending to the role of shame to the extent that we need to in medical education. And I think that's to the detriment of our students and probably ourselves. Shame is embedded um, in the things we do, in the way we do them, and in the ways we've structured our profession and our institutions, whether it's through institutionalized racism, whether it's through shame-based teaching and learning, um, whether it's through the extreme hierarchies we maintain and the power dis um, disbursement um, and accumulation that occurs. I mean, shame is embedded in what we do. It's part of the reason it's, there's inherent risk, but we've built a system that uses shame in, in certain ways. And the great thing about the fact that we built it that way is that we can dismantle it and build it a different way. Shame did not naturally come into the medical profession. We brought it there and we kept it there. Um, the effects of shame on identity formation, which appear to be significant and can be significantly positive, depending on the way in which the shame is engaged with, that begins well before medical school. Professional identity formation begins well before medical school. This does not start when someone walks through the doors on day one. It's, it, the, this is, this is an, such an obvious statement, we're actually just say it out loud, but we're all forming as individuals well before we come into medicine. How much are we attending to that formation uh, and, and what's gone into that formation in the people that join our communities? I don't think we do um, to the extent we need to. Um, our extreme reliance on scores appears to drive shame susceptibility, both in the environment and at the individual level. I mean, this needs so much more unpacking, um, but the, the maniacal um, pursuit of high scores among students is driving significant emotional distress. And that's not just at the medical school level, it's the undergraduate level, it's the high school level. We have got to reckon with our use of scores. Um, we've got to also reckon with how inclusive our environments and our, to what extent do they um, facilitate authentic self-expression? Um, not just, I mean, for all people, but especially those, um, around whom the system is not built or intended to serve. Can people be safe being their authentic selves when they come to work? Can they do so without the risk of shame and other emotional forms of emotional distress? Um, that is one of our greatest challenges and charges, I think, as, as, as leaders in education. And then if we're gonna advance well-being, um, which is you know, a hot topic in healthcare these days, um, we've got to go beyond the things we can measure easily and observe easily like burnout and depression, anxiety, et cetera. And we've got to go, we've got to bring shame into this conversation. I'm totally appreciative of the choir here, uh, but this is the message we have to take out to our communities because uh, it's so stigmatized and it's so, it exists so deeply in the shadows um, that it, it's going to take a real concerted, courageous effort to give shame the level of attention that it deserves. And that I think is required to create the environments and the well, the well-rounded uh, people that we hope to create. Well, the last three things um, we can do, help our learners retain broad sources of self-worth. You know, help them counteract that, the, the performance pressure that, that can drive some of that performance-based self-esteem. Um, and still true belonging and authentic self-expression. You know, what can you do right now to make the environment safer for, for all people um, and to be themselves in all ways. 
And then we really need to consider that with what um, Messick has entitled in his validity framework, the consequential validity of our assessment methods. Not, not just are we using the scores in a way that um, is valid, but what are the emotional impacts of the ways in which we're using that score? This is a form of validity that's rarely talked about and, and that is you know, problematically so because there really do appear to be significant impacts. And then finally, we need to create forums um, for this emotion to be shared and discussed, just like the one that Luna and, um, and co have created today. So thank you so much for the opportunity to, um, to speak to you all. If, if and when we do all these things, if we leverage the sort of the power of connection and shared experience, um, empathy, and really love for one another that, that our environments demand and the work we do demands, then, then there's a real chance to build community uh, and connection um, through the experience of shame, e even if it's painful. So with that, um, I'll stop. And Luna, I don't know if there's time for questions or, or, um, or, or not, but thank you so much for being here. Great, thank you so much, Will. So we have a few minutes for questions. Um, Ruth, yeah. I think it might be muted on your end, Luna. Work there we go. was received by students and the kind of insight into how the how how shame operates and damages people, but also I wondered how um, your research was experienced and received by your colleagues. Yeah, um, I, I didn't catch the first part of your question, but I think I got enough of it um, to answer it. So um, it's been very well received. So I mean, many of you can probably relate to this, but. Um, it's rare that I give a talk where I don't feel something transforming in the room. And it's not because of my talk, it's because of, it's because of we've created a space for something that people are experiencing, but really may struggle to engage with or acknowledge um, either in themselves or certainly within their environments. And it's, it just feels like you're, um, it's a release of something, you know, that you, you, you're creating something real, almost sacred in terms of the space that people really appreciate. So there, there's always some skepticism. I mean, especially among people or a generation um, at times that has used shame as a teaching strategy, right? Where they think that it's really serves a necessary function. The easy answer to that is that there's got to be a better way to teach people than to shame them. I mean, if, and if you can't figure out how to teach someone without shaming them, then you shouldn't be an educator. Just, it's, there's too much emotional baggage and emotional toll that comes from using shame as a teaching strategy. So that's where I've, I've found a little bit of pushback. Um, inside times, people will talk, anytime they hear a wellness talk, they'll say, you're just trying to make everybody soft. This is not about making people soft. <clears throat> this is actually about finding ways to push them harder and to higher levels of, of achievement through a growth orienting, shame sensitive, shame resilient approach to education. Thank you. Have you, have you ever met with any resistance to that idea of emotional authenticity? Um, I think I've been met with discomfort <clears throat> more than resistance. So um, yeah, I think it's been more, more discomfort. Um, I think people, if they're defensive to it or resistant to it, um, is likely from their own unprocessed experiences of shame. Um, I, it's pretty easy to make compelling arguments for why this emotion needs to be in our lexicon, why we need to have awareness of it, why we need to provide support mechanisms for it. Uh, it's, it I, I don't have any problem creating strong arguments that are that are generally academically well-received. It's, it's usually, a just discomfort with the even just the word itself but the topic itself that is where resistance may lie um all that said i mean duke is a you know no stranger to shame i'll tell you there's a lot of um, factors at play that, that that predispose and drive shame at duke and they've been remarkably open to, to all the work we've done so far jane has a question Oops. 
Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Well, this was fascinating. Um, so I'm a philosopher, and this is my first approach to these kind of topics. But I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, whether you found any examples of people being uh, able to uh, cope well with it or evaluate it positively, because I'm very skeptical of this view of shame as inherently toxic and so bad. And so, you know, something we should do away with. And I'm wondering if the problem is more uh, uh, creating an environment where it's impossible to cope with it, where it's not uh, open for people to actually process it in a constructive way and learn from it, but rather, you know, they have to hide it and repress it and so on. So we're just curious about what you thought about that and whether you have examples of positive mm -hmm. stories. Yes, it's such a great question. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, in fact, we have an entire data set of the ways in which people have coped with, um, recovered from, or grown from their shame. We have, we have so much data from this, these interviews that we have made a, an explicit decision to, to not analyze that data um, until we have, to our, to our liking, satisfactorily um, conveyed the, the phenomenon itself. And so the next study we're planning is, is taking codes from across the three data sets that are already coded around resilience factors from the person, the environment, coping strategies, ways they've experienced growth. And, and really what we're going to propose is a theory of shame resilience. And I don't know if that's the word we'll use, but shame recovery resilience um, and in medical trainees. So the answer is absolutely. There's absolutely meaningful growth that is occurring through these experiences it seems to be afforded by certain things in the environment or within the individual um but but this is this story is not all about how bad shame is it's just the we just haven't gotten to, to the whole story yet so yeah thank you for making that point I, that's important to present this in that way thank you and then jane There's a roaming mic being moved around the That's room. Well, so. It's working really well. <laughs> Thanks, Will. As, as somebody who came through medical education myself, I really recognize these, this uh, education by shame, and I've got examples myself. The, one of the things that struck me very much about well, the, the story you told about the individual um, experiencing shame and having this kind of blowout as a, as, as a medical, well, in the past, the medical education, I would think right, that, that guy needs to go. <laughs> so I then began to think, well, okay, um, there are, you produced implications, but you know, here's a, somebody with a narcissistic, well, seemingly narcissistic. Do we want somebody like, like that in medicine? I'm being provocative here. But what are the implications of your work for admissions, for example, as a as a as a as an element? And because what you're saying really is okay, we need to open out the profession to a wider range of people because that represent the the, the population, and we not need not to make it so kind of narrow, narrowly focused all around people that fit. Um, but are there implications for your work for admissions? Would you start to use that in terms of choosing when you're talking about resilience, for example, just there? I mean, what, what's your response yeah, to that? Um, huge. Um, I, I'll just make two brief comments. So I think to the point about you know, that student needing to go, it's, you can make a compelling argument for that. Once he started peeling out the layers of the onion, what, what, we, what he realized is that a lot of his emotional functioning is, is related to some probably some psychopathology really that, that can be, that was for him was successfully intervened with through therapy. He had a very successful months long therapy intervention that really changed him um, and changed his perspective, uh, made him more shame resilient in a lot of ways. And it's frankly, is gonna make him a better doctor. So um, I think we just need to, before we react and kick people out of the profession um, or make them feel like they deserve to kick out of the profession that we really think about how we can support them uh, maximally first. And then if they don't turn around, yes, they gotta go, 100%. Um, the question about admissions, I think, oh my gosh, it's such, there's such a, um, a gauntlet here. I, I, I think the first thing I would say is that we have got to think about the values that we are pr promoting through the ways we use scores. Um, 
what happens is, it, what can happen is at the pre-medical level, students will just, they'll just ditch everything else, everything in their lives to, to get the scores they need, thinking that, that that becomes the marker of success in medicine. And that has to be continued in medical school and beyond. And then it doesn't. Suddenly the scores go away and suddenly you have to function in different environments with different metrics, different sources of, you know, um, feedback about how you're doing. And it's, it's a, it can be really disorienting. So really this is a pitch for holistic review. Um, can we, we can't depart from scores. I'm not saying that, but can we create more balance um, and not rely on them so heavily or at least ensure that the way we rely on them is not driving values in pre-medical trainees and reinforcing those values in a way that's discordant from the values needed in the profession, like empathy, like um, resilience, like work ethic, um, perseverance, grit. So, um, you know, to the extent that we screen for shame in the admission process, that has been brought up provocatively at times. I don't think we should do that. Um, so there's probably a, we could probably take this too far, um, but, but I would maybe encourage you all to reflect on how we change admissions. Um, I don't have an answer to that yet. I think we do need to address it. Thanks very much. Good. And then final question from Sophia. Thank you, Will. It was quite fascinating work and the compilation. And the quick question I couldn't stop thinking about was uh, like the shame resilience when you were referring to, and then when you had this table of uh, discussion of negative effects of uh, uh, shame, the growth mindset versus fixed mindset, is it required? I mean, the Carol Vick talks about it. So, I mean, do you think, I mean, is it like by default, it's very important to have a growth mindset? Do you think so for resilience? Thank you. Yes, um, it's in, that's in our um, second paper, our paper on medical education. We actually took, that's one of the, that was one of the factors um, that, that either predisposed shame or, or amplified shame was was possessing a fixed mindset. That's been actually very present in our data set. Um, insofar as it seems that fixed mindsets may drive shame or shame proneness may drive fixed mindsets. And it makes sense. If, if I don't believe that I can ever be good at this task, that I only have a fixed amount of ability here, any failure is just going to prove that to me, that you, you can't be good enough at this. You are incompetent. You are um, you aren't capable of learning more, which really in, in, in a way is a shame reaction. And, um, and, and then also if you experience shame or not good enough, I, I can never be good enough, I'm incompetent, that's gonna fuel a fixed mindset. Conversely, um, really we found what may be links between a guilt response or propensity towards guilt and a growth mindset, um, whereby I, if I believe that I can get better at anything that I do, that I am, my capacity for anything is, is, is not limited, um, then failure presents an opportunity for that growth to occur. But in order for that to lead to growth, I think there has to be a focus on actions we can fix um, and, and things that we can change and then a path to doing so. So there, there do appear to be significant emotional connections to these different differing mindsets. I think at the self-conscious level, and I don't believe within the, the mindset literature that that's been really explored. Um, so thank you for mentioning that. It's, it's critically important and helping learners adopt a growth mindset is probably one of the best things that we can do to help them learn in an emotionally engaged, resilient way. We've run out of time. So I'd just like everyone to thank me and joining Will for his really insightful and fascinating and very aesthetically pleasing talk. <laughs> Loved your slides. <laughs> Thanks, Will. <laughs>